just um, say that my heart is with everybody. Um, I want to express my, I don't know who's watching right now, so I want to express my condolences to all those who have lost loved ones during this time. Um, we know of a number of people, and in fact, I lost a dear friend just before all of this quarantine stuff started. And, um, and times are different. We weren't able to spend time together with those who were left behind. But Lord, you are great and you are glorious and, and you provide for us. And that's what we believe. So, as I said, I want to, um, I want to talk about courage today, but I'm going to start out in Romans 10. And what I want to do is, um, I don't know, I guess frame what I'm going to do. Um, a lot of what I do today will be reading scripture, which I know that God's word is good enough. Um, can you take those away? That's really distracting. Thank you. Um, God's word is good enough for us and, um, and it provides insight for us. So, Lord, I also pray that you would speak today, Lord, that it wouldn't even be my words, but your word as I read it would speak to your people. So I'm going to start in Romans 10, and um, this is kind of an if-then situation. I wish I had a, a whiteboard right now where I knew how to share slides online. That would make this maybe a little easier, but I'm just going to start in verse 14. How then will they call on him in whom they have not believed? This is, it's kind of like a riddle almost, the way this is written or, um, or a poem. How will they believe in him who they have not heard? And how will they hear without a preacher? How will they preach unless they are sent, just as it is written? How beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news of good things. However, they did not all heed the good news, for Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed our report? So faith comes from hearing and hearing by the word of Christ. And um, that's what we're going to do today. We're going to hear the words of Christ. And um, in this thing that I just read, if you look at it, um, how then will they call on him who they have not believed? You could say, if you believe, then you will call on Jesus or call on God. How will they believe in him who they have not heard? And you could say, if you have heard Jesus' word, then you have the chance to believe. And how will they hear without a preacher? If you encounter a preacher, then you can be preached to. And how will they preach unless they are sent? If a preacher is sent, then they can preach God's word. And um, what I want to do today is bring the good news of good things. And that's what Jesus did. Jesus brought the good news of good things. And if we take this whole thing and we turn it around sort of backwards, you know, we can look at it this way. Jesus came with the good news of good things. He was sent by the Father. He preached the Father's words. People heard the words so that they were given the chance to believe. If they did believe, they were able to call on Jesus and even to do the works of Jesus. So, basically, we have a formula that enables us to believe. And this is how, you know, God accounts sin to us is because we have heard the word. And also, you know, we have a calling to preach the word. So let me move ahead here. Okay. We don't acquire faith, belief, or courage without first being a disciple of Jesus and, hear, and learning of him and his father's words. So the main part of this is going to be um, in, I'm going to be talking about John 13, 14, 15, and 16. 
And a lot of these things I'm going to go over, like in John 13, I'm going to kind of go over briefly. You know, we're all hearing about fear in the news. I, I watch the national news and the international news, and, and there are always questions about should be should we be worrying about this? The, um, the commentators will say that they'll be interviewing famous people in medicine or whatever, and they'll say, well, should we worry that so-and-so didn't do something early enough? Or should we worry about this aspect of the economy or whatever? And that's kind of a silly question in my mind, because if we're using wisdom, we know that worry and fear don't really do anything to help any situation. So um, in these different chapters that I'm going to be going through with you, um, starting with John 13, Jesus fully disclosed who he was to his disciples. He gave them awareness about himself to prepare them to possess courage when they needed it. And um, it's the same thing that he does with us as believers. Um, you know, if we know the word of God, if we've heard the preacher, um, faith comes by hearing and hearing the words of Christ. So that's what we're going to do. We're going to hear the words of Christ. So starting out in John 13, I'm just going to highlight some main points. At this point, my dog is, is trying to get something from me here. Sorry. At this point, things were leading towards Jesus' crucifixion. There was the Passover or the Last Supper, which took place, and that was the establishment of the Lord's Supper that we celebrate, um, Holy Communion. The, the disciples shared a meal with Jesus. Jesus washes the disciples' feet. Jesus speaks of his being betrayed by one of them. And then the disciples examine them, themselves and ask who it will be. They need some water. Satan activates betrayal in Judas's heart. Jesus speaks of leaving them, and the disciples are grieved. Peter asks why he can't follow Jesus to where he's going and pledges loyalty that he's going to lay down his life for Jesus. And Jesus prophesies that Peter will shortly be tested in that and fail. And Peter does not understand the full implications of Jesus' death or his own heart or his own lack of courage at that point. So moving on to um, John 14, and I'm most of this is coming from the New American Standard Bible, which is my favorite. Um, <clears throat> Jesus um, starts to comfort his disciples and he also starts to flesh out a picture of the Holy Trinity mystery. So um, in the first verse, do not let your heart be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many dwelling places. Farther moving down, I go to prepare a place for you. I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also, and you will know the way where I am going or you know the way where I'm going. And Thomas says to him, Lord, we do not know the way that you're going. How do we know the way? And Jesus said to them, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father, but through me. So those are the directions. That's the, um, the directions from Jesus's um, map of the way to get to the Father. He is the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father but through Jesus. Oneness with the Father, talking about the Trinity. If you had known me, you would have known my Father also. From now on, you know him and have seen him. Philip said to him, Lord, show us the Father, and it's enough for Him for us. And, and Philip said that right after Jesus said, if you had known me, you would have known my Father also. From now on, you know him and have seen him. And we're pretty slow as human beings about things, and we just don't get things for some reason. I don't know if we 
just don't know how to listen properly or we hear what we want to hear. But anyways, so Jesus said to him, have I been so long with you and yet you have not come to know me, Philip? He who has sent me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Do you not believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me? The words that I say to you, I do not speak on my own initiative, but the Father abiding me, abiding in me does his works. Believe me that I am in the Father and the Father is in me. Otherwise, believe because of the works themselves. Truly, I say to you, he who believes in me, the works that I do, he will do also. And greater works than these he will do because I go to the Father. Whatever you ask in my name, that will I do, so that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask me anything in my name, I will do it. And so, um, let's see, he says, he who believes in me and the works that I do. Believing is, is a big thing. Believing is like, unbelief is one of the worst sins. Unbelief is um, something that we have to struggle with all the time. And we have to get to the point where we believe, you know, and, and belief is, is a matter of faith. Pastor's talking about mountain moving faith, but um, it's also trusting in God, you know, the things that happen, trusting that he's going to do what he says he does and knowing who he is, learning about him. And then the next thing is, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. So obedience to God's word also. And um, when I was reading through this, I noticed that this statement is, is written like four times. Yeah, four times. If you love me, you will keep my commandments. It, it may be worded slightly differently, but it's the same thing um, coming up really soon. So I will ask the Father and he will give you another helper that he may be, be with you forever. That's the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it does not see him or know him. The spirit of truth, the Holy Spirit. But you know him because he abides with you now and will be with you. So he he's with them while well, Jesus is with them, but also he will be in them after the time of Pentecost. I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. After a little while, the world will no longer see me, but you will see me because I live, you will live also. And looking at that, because I live, you live also, I thought it can't just mean exist on the planet, but because Jesus lives and um, we believe in him, we're spiritual beings. So to live is more than just to exist. It's to be awake to the spirit. It's to be aware of the spirit. It's to be aware of the things that go on around us in a greater way. Life in God is not like just existing. In that day, you will know that I am the father and you are, and you, that I'm sorry that I am in my Father, and you in me, and I in you. And and immediately I thought of Holy Communion with that, you know, when we um, celebrate the Lord's Supper. I'm in my Father, and you in me, and I in you. And then again, we hear that statement, he who has my commandments and keeps them is the one who loves me. And he who loves me will be loved by my Father. So keeping the commandments of God and I will love him and will disclose myself to him. I'll uncover myself, reveal myself. I'll image myself to him. Judas, not Iscariot said to him, Lord, what then has happened that you are going to disclose yourself to us and not to the world? And Jesus answered and said to him, here we go again. If anyone loves me, he will keep my word and my father will love him and he will come to him and make, we will come to him and make our abode with him. So there's the word of obedience. That's the third time. And then um, right after that, it says, he who does not love me does not keep my words. So that's the fourth time. And the word which you hear is not mine, 
Jesus talking, but the fathers who sent me. So here we go back again to, if you've seen me, you've seen the father and Jesus only does what the father does. He only does what he sees the father doing. He only says what the father says through him. So then going to the verse 25, these things I've spoken to you while abiding with you, but the helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all that I said to you. Peace I leave you, my peace I give to you, not as the world gives do I give to you. Do not let your hearts be troubled, nor let it be, nor let it be fearful. You heard what I said. I go away and I will come to you. If you loved me, you would have rejoiced because I go to the Father, for the Father is greater than I. Now I have told you before it happens, so that when it happens, you may believe. This is important. Now I have told you before it happens, so that when it happens, you may believe. I will not speak much more with you, for the ruler of the world is coming and he has nothing in me. But so that the world may know that I love the Father, I do exactly as the Father commanded me. Get up, let us go from here. So basically, um, this last verse, you know, that he says that, where is it right here? Um, the ruler of this world is coming and he has nothing in me. Jesus was pure, he had no sin. And so there were no strongholds. There were no strongholds in him. Satan couldn't come to him and say, oh, well, look at this thing that you do or that thing. He couldn't blackmail him, to put it in our terms. And this whole idea of now I have told you before it happens so that when it happens, you may believe. Jesus empathized with his disciples. He, he saw what they went through. He experienced their sorrows. He experienced their joy. Um, he, he understood what our plight is as human beings. And, um, you know, he, he knew what it was to be a son, to be a brother, um, to be a teacher, to go about his father's business. And he knew that there was sickness in the world and sin in the world. And we fight with all these things, but He's, he's now saying, I'm telling you this before it happens so that you'll be ready for it. And he's trying to prepare them. And he's always trying to prepare us. And having the word of God at our disposal is one of the ways that, that we can be prepared. But we cooperate in that. We have to find out who he is. We have to be a disciple. And we have to search for him in the word of God. We have to... Um, read the gospels and and know what jesus is about and that's how we know who the father is that's what, how we know who god is and that's one of the things that leads to courage it says um where is it right here um he's telling them not to be troubled or let their heart be troubled or let their heart be fearful because we already have foreknowledge of what's going to take place. So now I'm going to move on to John 15. I don't know if I'm going to end way early or what. I'm not really sure. So hopefully everything will work out just the way it's supposed to. Okay, that was 14. So this is 15. Okay. Jesus is the vine <coughs> and we as followers are the branches. I am the true vine, <clears throat> and my father is the vine dresser. So the father is the one that takes care of the vine. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes it away. And every branch that bears fruit, he prunes. And um, in my Bible, it says that means literally means cleans. He cleans it. He prunes it so that it may bear more fruit. So he's not just saying that he's going to cut away from us if um, we don't bear fruit, but he's going to cut away from us if we do bear fruit because he wants the fruit to be better and stronger. 
you're already clean because of the word which I've spoken to you. And um, in Ephesians 5.26, which you can look up later, it talks about the washing of the word and sanctification. Abide in me and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine, so neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine and you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him, he bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he is thrown away as a branch and dries up. And they gather them and cast them into the fire and they're burned. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. My father is glorified by this, that you bear much fruit. And so prove to be my disciples. Just as the Father has loved me, I have also loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love. So he says it again about obeying the commandments. You will abide in my love, just as I have my Father's commandments and abide in his love. These things I have spoken to you so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be made full. So he's fortifying his disciples. Um, The joy of the Lord is our strength. And um, it's important. We don't just deserve to have joy just because, you know, it's our American right. But, you know, because everybody's lot in light is different. Some people don't, you know, they have a lot of sorrow and a lot of problems in their life, even believers. But um, through being in Christ and Christ in us, our joy, his joy will be in us. We get that from him. Fortification for his disciples, learners, and studiers. I wrote that down in my notes here. So the more we learn about him, the more we um, can relate to who he is. And we understand that we're in him and he's in us. And I can't believe like in these, these scriptures that I'm reading to you right now, you know, how many times he basically is saying the same thing, talking about, you know, when he starts out talking about the whole idea of the Trinity, how he abides in the Father and the Father abides in him, and we abide in Jesus and Jesus abides in us. So we're all part of the same DNA. We're all part of that same bloodline. And um, because of that, that is why Jesus says we can ask for what we will and it will be granted to us because it's Jesus asking and not us. If Jesus goes ahead and um, tells his disciples um, something and then he comes along and says, well, I'm, you know, it's the father you've seen because what I said to you, it's not me, it's him. Well, then it becomes the same thing with us if we're asking for something in the name of Jesus or asking for something in um, while we are in Jesus, in Jesus Christ, then um, the Father recognizes that as him. So the disciples' relationship to each other now. This is my commandment that you love one another just as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, that one lay down his life for his friends. You are my friends if you do what I command you. So here we go again, over and over. um, Jesus talks about how our obedience really proves that we are his disciples. And um, let's see where I lost my place now. I'm so human, but that's okay. No longer do I call you slaves, for a slave does not know what his master is doing. But I've called you friends, for all things that I have heard from my Father, I have made known to you. So it's this this whole Trinitarian idea keeps keeps weaving its way through this, um, like mixing up in a bowl. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you would go and bear fruit and that your fruit would remain so that whatever you ask of the Father in my name, he may give you. So this is what I was just talking about. This this I command you, that you love one another. So 
as a commandment, he's just telling us, you know, that, um, where is it again? You are my friends if you do what I command you. And then he says, um, this I command you, that you love one another. So we, we do need to obey Jesus and all these things. And then Jesus starts to relate his experiences to his disciples, helps them to see where they stand and who they are in Christ. He's already been doing that, but he's doing that again. If the world hates you, <clears throat> you know that it has hated me before you, before it hated you. So Jesus, once again, is empathizing with his disciples and trying to give them um, forewarning and prepare them. He doesn't leave us um, to flounder on our own. If you were of the world, the world would love its own. But because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, because of this, the world hates you. Remember the word that I said to you, a slave is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. If they kept my word, wait a minute. If they kept my word, they will keep yours also. But all things they will do to you for my name's sake, Jesus' name's sake, because they do not know the one who sent me. And he's talking about persecution. If I had not come and spoken to them, they would not have sin. But now they have no excuse for their sin. He who hates me hates my father also. If I had not done among them the works which no one else did, they would not have sinned. But now they have both seen and hated me and my father as well. But they have done this to fulfill the word that is written in their law. They hated me without a cause. When the Holy Spirit comes, whom I will send to you from the Father, that is the spirit of truth who, who proceeds from the Father. He will testify about me and you will testify also because you have been with me from the beginning. So when he's talking about um, where sin comes from, it goes back to what I read in the beginning from Romans 10 about um, having the um, ability to hear the word of God because a preacher was sent and to know what the truth is, and then um, to disobey it or walk away from it, basically to not believe in Jesus, then it's accounted as sin. So um, he gives plenty of opportunities for us to turn to Jesus. And then, um, let's see, I wanted to read this too in that part because um, it just reminded me of that. In John 20 and 29, this was about when Jesus reappeared after his resurrection and um, Thomas wanted to examine Jesus because he was struggling with unbelief. And Jesus said to him, because you have seen me, have you believed? Blessed are they who did not see and yet believed. So there is that as well that, you know, um, we're, we're blessed when um, we are granted through his mercy and grace belief without having to, I don't know, test a million things. There are some people out there who struggle with belief because, um, because I think they're too logical or too, um, they know too much. And I don't know if it's because of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil or what it is, but um, everything has to be explained. Um, everything has to be dotted and crossed. And, and it's almost like they have to know why this, this is so, why that is so. And um, I don't know how, you know, how it happens that people can believe without having seen, but I feel like I can do that because I embrace the mystery of it. And um, I don't think that's a cop out because, you know, because I don't want to examine farther, but I think it's just, I think it's just the mercy of God and the grace of God that he gives some people the grace to just accept the mystery 
and to move on from there because it says blessed are they who have not seen and yet have they believed but um the more we learn about jesus too the more we believe um i i'm kind of thinking of things now that are, are muddling my brain because i'm thinking about um discussions i have with my children and that models my brain but anyways so that was 15 and now i'm moving on to 16. um in john 16 verse 1 these things i have spoken to you so that you may be kept from falling away they will make you outcasts from the synagogue and literally i guess that means have you excommunicated but an hour is coming for everyone who kills you to think that he's offering service to god and this sounds terrible these things they will do because they have not known the father or me but these things i have spoken to you so that when their hour comes you may remember that i told you them these things i did not say to you at the beginning because i was with you and, you know, I mean, I guess this is, some people might say, well, this is a negative word, but um, with what's going on right now, I'm sure there's a lot of fear that people are still experiencing because of it. Some people maybe have a false sense of security about it now because they think, okay, I've come this far and everything's fine. And so, you know, a lot of government um organizations throughout the United States are, are releasing their, um, you know, regulations for this and, and trying to give people more freedom because people are getting tired of staying in their houses and stuff. But it's a very real threat to us. And, you know, we never thought that this would happen. I'm sure none of us, you know, none of us would have imagined that all of a sudden one day, we would be fine and then the next day we'd be finding out that we all have to quarantine and that um something like a plague would encompass the whole earth and not you know be limited to one area but can other things happen yeah other things could happen even worse things could happen and so i'm not saying this because i'm being negative but maybe worse things will happen someday and i'm saying this because we have to be prepared in Christ. We have to be prepared in God. We have to know who he is. We have to know who we are in him and um, know what to expect. And we have to understand how to be courageous. And the only way that we can be courageous is by knowing him and by being in Christ and Christ in the Father and the Father in Christ and the Holy Spirit in us is being part of that that family being part of that um that's our security so when i read this i thought right away about the stoning of stephen you know when that happened and so i'm just going to read a little bit um from that 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 was in in um acts and um i'm going to start with act 6 8 now stephen a man full of god's grace and power performed great wonders and signs among the people opposition arose and i want to say before that too that basically stephen was this is after christ had ascended back into heaven and stephen was chosen um along with six other men because um some of the widows were being um i don't know what the right word is not ignored but they weren't being taken care of some of the widows in the in the synagogue weren't being taken care of and so men were chosen stephen being one to help to take care of them to oversee that with other men and um stephen turned out to be a great um servant of god so I guess that talks about the whole thing of maybe gifts and callings and stuff too. Um, Stephen was called to do what some people might think was, you know, not such a great task. You have to go take care of the widows. 
I don't know whether that, it, you know, maybe he had to help them when th things broke, broke in their house or they needed food or um, whatever it was. And um, he did it, but he also was a man full of God's grace and power. And it says he performed great wonders and signs among the people. Opposition arose, however, from members of the synagogue of the freedmen. Jews of Cyrene and Alexandria, as well as the provinces of Cilicia and Asia, who began to argue with Stephen. But they could not stand up against the wisdom the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, gave him as he spoke. And so these are people from the synagogue. They're, you know, fellow believers. And then they secretly persuaded some men to say, we have heard Stephen speak blasphemous words against Moses and against God. So they stirred up the people and the elders and the teachers of the law. They seized Stephen and brought him before the Sanhedrin. They produced false witnesses who testified. This fellow never stops speaking against his, this holy place and against the law. For we have heard him say that this Jesus of Nazareth will destroy this place and change the customs Moses handed down to us. And, you know, that is a spirit of religion. Um, man trying to be in control of what only God is in control of. All who were sitting in the Sanhedrin looked intently at Stephen, and they saw that his face was like the face of an angel. And so then after this point, in Acts 7, Stephen gives this great speech to these people, the Sanhedrin, and um, he would, basically he was preaching and he started talking about the history um, of God's people. And he, he talked about Abraham and he talked about um, Joseph and, and what happened with Joseph. He talked about um, Moses and um, let's see. And then anyways, it, when it came toward the end, um, he, he starts talking about um, Solomon who built a house for God and, and, you know, the Sanhedrin were still defending the religious practices of the Jews. And however, Stephen says, the most high does not live in houses made by human hands. As the prophet says, heaven is my throne and the earth is my footstool. What kind of house will you build for me, says the Lord? Or where will my resting place be? Has not my hand made all these things? And then Stephen, basically, he um, he speaks the truth. He prophesies to them. And he says, you stiff-necked people, your hearts and ears are still uncircumcised. You're just like your ancestors. You always resist the Holy Spirit. Was there ever a prophet your ancestors did not persecute? They even killed those who predict who predicted the coming of the righteous one. And now you have betrayed and murdered him. You have received the law that was given through angels, but have not obeyed it. And then um, when the members of the Sanhedrin heard this, they were furious and gnashed their teeth at him. But Stephen, full of the Holy Spirit, looked up to heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. Look, he said, I see heaven open up and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. At this, they covered their ears and yelling at the tops of their voices, they all rushed at him, dragged him out of the city and began to stone him. Meanwhile, the witnesses laid their coats at the feet of a young man named Saul. While they were stoning him, Stephen prayed, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Then he fell on his knees and cried out, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. When he had said this, he fell asleep. So Stephen had great courage because not only did he go through this um, persecution, the murdering that they did to him, and really the torturing while they were stoning him, but he was still able to um, cry out to God at the end um, and to ask God to forgive them. So this was one of the things that Jesus was warning them about. And there were many more. Let's see, where am I? Okay. So back to John 16. Um, but now I'm, Jesus says, I'm going to him who sent me. 
And none of you asks me, where are you going? Because he already told them. But because I have said these things to you, sorrow has filled your heart. But I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away. For I do not go away. The helper will not. If I do not go away, the helper will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you, the Holy Spirit. And he, when he comes, will convict the world concerning sin. That goes back to Romans that I read in the beginning, Romans 10. Concerning sin and righteousness and judgment. Concerning sin because they do not believe in me. So unbelief, a very basic sin. And concerning righteousness because I go to the Father and you no longer see me. Christ returns to the Father in righteousness and truthfulness of all he said. And concerning judgment, because the ruler of this world has been judged, Christ overcame Satan on the cross, and he triumphed. I have many more things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. But when he, the spirit of truth, comes, he will guide you into all truth. For he will not speak on his own initiative, but whatever he hears, he will speak, and he will disclose to you what is to come. He will glorify me for he will take of mine and will disclose it to you. So it's just like Jesus said that, um, you know, when he speaks, the Father is speaking through him. All things that the Father has are mine. Therefore, I said that he takes of mine and will disclose it to you. This is talking about the, the Holy Spirit. And um, Jesus talks about his death and resurrection a little in a little while and you will no longer see me. And again, a little while, and you will see me. Some of his disciples then said to one another, what is this thing he's telling us? A little while, and you will not see me. And again, a little while, and you will see me. And because I go to the Father. So they were saying, what is this that he says? A little while. We do not know what he is talking about. Jesus knew that they wished to question him. And he said to them, are you deliberating together about this? That I said a little while and you will not see me and again a little while and you will see me. Truly, truly, I say to you that you will weep and lament, but the world will rejoice. You will grieve, but your grief will be turned, grief will be turned into joy. Whenever a woman is in labor, she has grief or pain because her hour has come. But when she gives birth to the the beautiful human child, she no longer remembers the anguish because of the joy that the child has been born into the world. Therefore, you too have grief now, but I will see you again and your heart will rejoice and no one will take your joy away from you. In that day, you will not question me about anything. Truly, truly, I say to you, if you ask the Father for anything in my name, holy cow, I'm running out of time, okay. In my name, he will give it to you. Until now, you have asked for nothing in my name. Ask and you will receive so that your joy may be made full. These things I have spoken to you in figurative language. An hour is coming when I will no longer speak to you in figurative language, but will tell you plainly of the Father. In that day, you will ask in my name. And I do not say to you that I will request of the Father on your behalf. For the Father himself loves you, because you have loved me and have believed that I came forth from the Father. I came forth from the Father and have come into the world. I am leaving the world again and going to the Father. So right here, he's explaining what all of those previous teachings were about. Now that we know Jesus, we can ask directly. We don't have to say, Jesus, please you know, ask the Father for us, for the fa because um, the Father himself loves us. His disciples said, lo, now you are speaking plainly and are not using a figure of speech. Now we know that you know all things and have no need for anyone to question you. By this we believe that you came from God. Jesus answered them, do you now believe? Behold, an hour is coming and has already come for you to be scattered each to his own home and leave me alone. And yet I am not alone because the Father is with me. These things I have spoken to you so that in me you may have peace. And here's the, 
the scripture that I personally started with. In the world you have tribulation, but take courage. I have overcome the world. So the only way that we can take courage is by knowing all of the, these things and knowing that Jesus has overcome the world and being in the Father and being in Jesus and Jesus in the Father and the Father in Jesus and the Holy Spirit in us. Um, and so I'm just going to pray now. I I guess I'm at the end here. And Lord, I just, I just pray that you would take all these weak words that I've spoken today and my uncertainty sounding messages coming from my voice, Lord, and that you would speak your word to your people, Lord God. I pray that you would bring them back to these verses, these scriptures, Lord God, and have them examine them for themselves. Romans 10, John 13, 14, 15, 16, Lord, and to understand how wonderful you are and how mysteriously and wonderfully you've connected us to you, to the Father, to the Holy Spirit, and how you are with us at all times, and that we would learn, we would be faithful disciples, and we would learn of your character to know truly who you are. And then, Lord, we will have courage. We will have courage because you have overcome the world. So we just thank you for this time together and um, just ask for your blessings. I, I just ask for your blessings on the um the communion message lord i ask for your blessings on pastor ozzy's message maybe he can sort out some of what i said i don't know and um lord i just thank you for your love your love that covers everything lord god in our lives um i just bless you and worship you in jesus name so um i'm gonna be signing off now i hope you got something out of that and um right and the service will start at 11 right now it's 10 48 so you actually have time to get something ready for communion because we'll have communion together so get your oreos or your crackers or your corn chips and your water or your juice and um be ready to share communion with all of us we will do that all together I love you guys. I miss you guys. Um, but thanks for coming to my family room today and spending some time with me. And um, hopefully we'll see each other again soon. And thank you. <laughs> so now I have to figure out how to shut this off. Where's my remote file? Oh, there it is. Okay, and live video. Okay.